sorry to hear about that. What was he, uh, what was he doing that he got shocked that hard? Uh, to explain it without typing, he was uh, experimenting uh, what he would call science, I suppose, with two uh, open wires, uh, a, a hedge trimmer. The cord got cut. And he, uh, in his curiosity, decided uh, he's 17, by the way. <laughs> he uh, he decided to reconnect them and there was a large flash his muscles twitched and he had to lay down for a bit so we've uh, we've been berating him about that for a while yeah i'm glad your brother's okay that's intense yeah. and you know, therein lies the major issue when it comes to the irritability side is an electrical signal that's big enough is going to override and cause your muscles to contract and that's why unfortunately when you hear about people being electrocuted like you yep. You, yeah, you can't let go of the wire because it's forcing the muscles of your forearm to contract. So you're literally stuck there. And that's, yeah, ooh, yeah. So, well, I'm glad he's okay. And uh, he didn't win himself a Darwin Award. Um, yeah, and so obviously part of that irritability leads itself into uh, our ability to develop tension, which is going to be, you know, the actual contractile producing force component of the muscle. So... Now, when it comes to elasticity, we have what's known as the parallel elastic component, and this is going to be what's running in parallel, okay? So that's going to be the membranes of the muscles. And then we have the series elastic component, so that's running in series, and that's going to be our tendons. So when we look at the entire unit together, we're going to have the parallel elastic component the last series last component. And then inside of that, we're going to have the contractile component. So let's see if I can move around the camera in such a way that you guys can try this at home. So you're gonna set your hand on your desk, okay? So when I lift my finger up right there is I'm now going to be winding up that series elastic component of the tendons going from the muscle all the way to the end of my fingertip. And I'm gonna be winding up the parallel elastic component in the actual muscle belly. So I can lift that finger up nice and high and then I let it go and it's just gonna come on down. So it's just, gravity is obviously helping also. Now, I can then use the contractile component. So let's lift up and tap down, that's the muscles working. So now if I pull back and then I think about building tension with my muscles, you can feel how much more force you're able to hit that table with. And so that's something we're trying to utilize, which is not just the contractile components of our muscles, but also those elastic parallel and series components in order to optimize force production. So a great example of using this is what's known as the stretch shortening cycle, which is where we're going to have an eccentric contraction immediately followed by a concentric contraction. And what can you guys think of would be good examples of this? What can you guys think that would be good examples of this? Think of it as a rubber band is a great example of using the elastic component, or it's because it's what it is, elasticity. I'm referring to where can you think of in a sporting movement? Would you expect to see that stretch shortening cycle?
you know, shooting a basketball because you're going to wind up and come back. You're going to jump typically. So you're going to have that elastic component of squatting down a little bit first and then propelling yourself upwards. You're typically always going to be utilizing this as a means to help improve your force production. So a muscle fiber, something you're going to hopefully have already learned in anatomy and physiology, and you're obviously going to be going through a lot more with me in exercise phys, is simply going to be one muscle, individual sarcomeres, and everything inside of a sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane for a muscle fiber, and then inside has the specialized fluid that's a cytoplasm, but we call it sarcoplasm. So our fibers are going to run along the lengths of that entire muscle belly. Some don't go the entire distance. A number of them do. They're going to grow in both length and diameter as we are going to get older. Once they get to effectively that arguable maximal length, which you can potentially increase through a lot of stretching and otherwise, what you're going to find is those muscles in turn, as far as they're increasing in diameter, that's cross-sectional area, and that's what allows us to produce more force. And that can increase, but that's going to increase mostly due to doing things like resistance training of some form. Now, individual muscle fibers are going to be innervated by a motor unit. There is going to be one motor unit that is going to innervate a number of fibers. So it's not one individual fiber has one motor unit. Instead, you're going to go ahead and see one motor unit for 10 to maybe thousands of individual muscle fibers. And what's really fascinating is your fast twitch fibers are going to innervate more individual fibers than your slow twitch motor units where they're going to innervate smaller numbers of fibers. And we're going to get into why that's important in a little bit. So fast twitch fibers, they simply produce force faster than slow twitch. They are not stronger than slow twitch fibers when you're looking at a even amount of cross-sectional area for both, the key is you're going to see a earlier peak in that max force when you're looking at fast switch fibers. So the characteristics where we're gonna see we have not just our fast switch, uh, sorry, slow twitch and fast switch, we have two different forms of fast switch in healthy, mature muscle. So you've got your 2A and then you have your 2B. Now 2B is sometimes referred to as 2X. It's essentially the same thing. Some people like to get into weird arguing when you hang out with a bunch of PhDs over what's what, don't worry about it. But the basic idea is your slow twitch are much more aerobically uh, predisposed. They're going to do a much better job with high duration, low power outputs Whereas your fast switch fibers obviously have an advantage for really high power exercises. However, they're going to fatigue out at a much higher rate. Now, another thing to keep in mind, specifically when we're talking about biomechanics, which is how our muscle fibers are going to be organized. So some fibers are simply all running parallel. So they're straight line muscles. Others are going to be in what's known as pennation. So they're going to have effectively pulling along angles. Now, each of these are going to give you certain advantages and disadvantage. Parallel are going to allow you to go faster, but you're gonna produce a smaller amount of force. Pennates are going to not allow you to contract as quickly, but they are going to allow you to produce far more force. So good example of parallel fibers, this would literally be things like your abs. Whereas when you're looking for something to pennate, that's where you're gonna see things like your quadriceps, is going to be, um, well, specifically erectus femoris, is going to be a great example of this. So we get a greater range of motion. However, we're not going to be producing effectively as great of a force advantage. So questions about in, uh, pination of muscles. Awesome, thank you. So 
We talked briefly a moment ago about how we're going to innervate a smaller number of fibers with our slow twitch motor units or motor neurons than we are going to be doing with our fast twitch. Now, this is because we're going to only essentially recruit our slow twitch fibers first, then we're going to recruit our fast twitch fibers. This is going to A, allow you to be more efficient because you're using more aerobic muscle fibers, but B, if we're innervating a smaller number of individual units at a time, you are going to do a better job at slowly increasing your force. So you're going to have effectively more control in that movement that you're doing. So for example, when it comes to you guys uh, working out, when you're lifting a heavy weight, you want to contract everything as fast as possible and you want to be really quick and powerful with it. Whereas when you're trying to write, you want to be just recruiting enough fibers so you can do what you need to. Imagine if every single time you try to write, you used all of your muscle groups at the same time. You would be wildly out of control and it would be really difficult to do anything in a really coordinated fashion. Now, when we're actually going to be having a muscle produce tension, concentric is gonna be when it's shortening, eccentric is when it's lengthening, and isometric is when it's holding position. So, for example, whenever you are, say, squatting a heavy weight, when you've, you've got the bar on your back and then you start to lower your body, what type of contraction is your quadricep going through when you're squatting down? Remember, you're squatting, you're lowering yourself. So is your, are your quadriceps shortening or lengthening in the downward movement of the back squat? Exactly. So what do we call a lengthening contraction? Bingo. That's an eccentric. So when you're paused in the bottom of the squat, what type of contraction are you doing? Bingo. And so obviously when you're lifting yourself up, that would be the concentric. So it's important, especially when you guys are going through and doing your projects, you have to ask yourself, is that muscle actually contracting against the resistance, though it is lengthening? So it's an eccentric contraction of those muscles. It's an easy mistake to think, oh, we're squatting down, so I'm using my hamstrings to pull myself down. Like, oh, heck no. I mean, unless you, uh, you are not afraid of the reaper, you're probably not actively pulling yourself down into the bottom of the squat. You are controlling that descent through an eccentric contraction of your quads and your glutes. So when we're talking about movements though, the agonist is going to be the movement or the muscle that's actually producing the movement. The antagonist is going to be the one that's going to work in opposition. The stabilizer obviously gonna help stabilize. And then we have a neutralizer. And this is gonna make sure that we get rid of any unwanted activity. So Really simple example, this would be something like doing a dumbbell curl. When we're curling the weight up, what muscle is going to be our agonist? When we're curling the weight up, what muscle is going to be our agonist? Good. Now, what muscle group is going to be the antagonist? Yes, the triceps. Now, what muscle groups are going to work as stabilizers? If we're doing a dumbbell curl.
So do keep in mind, guys, when you're doing that curl, you're also going to be using your brachioradialis and your brachialis that are going to work as agonists. Your Anconius te technically is working as an antagonist, technically. Yeah, the forearm muscles a little bit to stabilize the load. Make sure your wrist isn't just kind of doing whatever with the weight. What about muscle groups like your deltoids? Are they going to effectively try to keep your arm in that position? What about your scapular retractors? What about your obliques? What about your spinal erectors? What about, especially if you're standing with it, what effectively are your quads, glutes, hams, and calves doing? They're all trying to stabilize your body. Does that make sense? Now, what muscle group is going to work as a neutralizer? What muscle group is going to act as a neutralizer? What are the two major actions of the bicep? One of them obviously is elbow flexion, but what's another thing that the bicep is going to help do? Remember, it's going to give you flexion of the shoulder. That long head of the biceps is attaching in the shoulder. It's actually helping lift. So your lat is effectively going to work as a neutralizer. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. So we then are gonna have situations of what's known as active and passive insufficiency, which is due to where our joint is at, we're not going to be able to produce as much force. So a great example of this is literally working with your wrist. So when your wrist is completely cocked over as far as you can, and then trying to make a fist as hard as you can. And you'll notice if you try to keep your hand at the same level, and you try to close your hand, you're gonna notice you can't really do it because we're in that point of what's known as active insufficiency. Now, you can do the same thing when you're trying to use your hip flexor. So lifting your leg up as high as you can, then straighten your leg. Now you also have the issues with your hamstring, but notice your rectus femoris is working on both extending your leg and trying to lift your leg up since it is also a hip flexor and you're gonna have a hard time keeping that leg up high. Now for passive insufficiency, which is let's go the opposite direction, reach your hand back as far as you can and then close your fist and you're not gonna be as strong here and notice you naturally, as you make that fist, you wanna bring your hand more neutral. So think about how far you can go back and then close your wrist and how much further you can go. And so you could lay down on the ground pull your thigh up to your chest and then try to straighten your leg and you're gonna feel that point where yes, you are over stretching your hamstrings for probably nearly all of you guys in that position. Now, an important concept to always understand is what's known as the force velocity curve, which is the higher the velocity, 
the lower the force we're going to produce, the lower the velocity, the higher the force we're going to produce. So, for example, if you're throwing a baseball, you're over here. It's a low force, you know, light ball that you're trying to throw as quickly as you can. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got something like a maximal squat, deadlift, where you're not moving fast at all, but you're able to produce maximal force. And so when we're working with individuals, what do you think we want to do to this curve? What do you think we want to do with this curve? No, no matter what, it's going to be parabolic, John. You can't really change the basics of physiology. But what you can do is increase your maximal force ability. And through things like plyometrics, you can try to increase your maximal velocity. So really trying to do is shift the curve up and to the right. And that in turn is going to allow us to effectively be a better athlete. Now, we then have what's known as the length tension relationship, which is where our amount of tension we're going to produce is going to be, when it comes to the active muscle, produced where we're at effectively its normal resting length, because that's where we have the best overlap between actin and myosin, which is something we're going to get into a lot more in exercise physiology. Now, as we go into a more and more shortened position, we're not going to be able to produce as much force because we're going to have effectively a muscle group that the sarcomeres are starting to, the actin strands are starting to butt against each other. Myosin has nowhere else to go, so you're not able to produce much more active tension. Now, as the muscle lengthens, we're actually going to increase our force a bit more because now we are generating passive tension. So this is from that series and parallel elastic component that's going to allow us to actually produce a greater amount of force in the bottom parts of the range of motion. Now, why do you guys think this graph ends? Why do you think this graph ends at some point? No worries. What happens on the far right side of that graph? Why does total tension, passive tension, why do those peak out at some point? True, Haley. So what do you think happens whenever you try to stretch that muscle a little bit further? Exactly. You have torn it off. So pros and cons, you get a little bit more force right before you take a little visit to Snap City. Now, this is what's known as Henneman's size principle. This is a very important concept to grasp. So the light gray circles, these are going to be those fast twitch motor neurons. And notice they are going to recruit much greater amounts, that's a bigger circle, of fast twitch fibers. The smaller, darker gray circles are our slow twitch motor units. 
And that's where we're going to be effectively recruiting a much smaller number of individual fibers per motor unit. And so you see, as you increase force production, you're going to increase recruit, or you're going to go up higher in the recruitment thresholds to where you're going to start to finally fire those biggest and most powerful muscle fibers. Does that make sense to you guys? Good. Now, what's actually helping determine what muscle fibers you're using is going to effectively come down to what's going on with the amount of signaling we're sending. Now, notice these graphs are different in their time periods and that we're using calcium, obviously, is a major indicator because calcium, as you're going to learn, is a big component of muscular contraction and muscular recruitment that we're going to go ahead and be able to send the signal much more frequently to our slow twitch than we do our fast twitch because simply because they're not going to last as long. Now, when we're looking at those muscle contractions, it's important to understand that it's an electrical followed by a chemical and then it's an electrical signal. So if we use a sensor to see when the charges flip from positive to negative, we're going to see a graphical explanation like this of individual fiber recruitment. Now, they use what's known as electromyography. And this is something we have in the lab. And if it wasn't for the fact that it requires, obviously, everybody to um, touch each other, we would, I would have you guys go ahead and do this for a lab. In fact, if you guys have got questions about it, let me know and we can try to set you up. But here's what's really interesting is when we put this electrode, obviously on your skin, so it then also has get, uh, there's some buffering effect that goes thanks to the fat underneath. And then it's going to pick up those electrical signals that we talked about just a moment ago, that's going to your individual muscle. Now, the key is this EMG, electromyography signal, is getting all of those individual fibers at the same time. So through the use of high quality, really, yeah, super impressive computing power, it's able to do what's known as decomposition. Decomposition effectively is going to take each of those individual signals and be able from this, what looks relatively noisy pattern, and then allow you to see each individual motor unit that is recruiting that muscle at the same time. This would be about the equivalent of if you're listening to music and you had like incredible software where you could effectively own, edit the music so that you only hear the guitar, you only hear the singer, you only hear the drums, you only hear the bassist. And then as opposed to the raw signal is the song itself and everyone obviously playing at the same time. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of those are gonna look similar because you got signals going back and forth and it is obviously muscle that's contracting, Luke. The key is with an EKG, you're looking at all, uh, you're looking at the atria, then you're looking at the neurological system of the AV node, AV bundle, bundle branches, and then into the Purkinje fibers, and then you're looking at the ventricle depolarized. But yes, it's going to look very similar. And they also have gap junctions, which really makes things a little bit different. Now, this is really high quality signal decomposition of notice in this example, the computer is able to extrapolate 34 different individual motor neurons recruiting or being recruited. And this is only a contraction of up to, or they're trying to hold it about 40% of their maximal volitional contraction. So the greatest force they could produce.
34 lunar units. That is bonkers. It's okay if you're a little perplexed. That's why we're recording. You can listen to it again. But right now, what questions do you guys have about this? Because you do need to understand how muscles contract and how it's obviously not one, but a huge number of individual motor units that are firing, which in turn are recruiting tens, if not into thousands of individual muscle fibers. Okay. There, there's got to be online. I don't, or there's probably someone that's put online. I don't have a good one to give you right now. Um, but this, yeah. And if I find anything, Luke, I'll make sure I put that up there so all you guys have got that also. So that motor cortex, we send the signal down our spinal cord, and then it's going to go to the muscle. Now you can also use a stimulator. That's really freaking painful where what you're gonna do is you're actually going to send an electrical signal by literally shocking the nerve. So the muscle's gonna contract and then you're gonna see effectively the spinal reflex which gives us that V wave. We're gonna see it kind of arc back again. Now you then have what's known as an H wave. And so that's where we're gonna have the stimulator where effectively we're looking at just our reflex going through our nervous system. So effectively, as we send that shock, it in turn is going to go to our spinal column and then reflexively send another signal to that muscle because the shock is both going to get the efferents and afferents at the same time. And what you're going to find is thanks to training, you're actually going to increase those muscular reflexes and be able to increase the effective V wave. So you're still looking at, you're gonna produce a greater amount of signal because literally our nervous system improves with training. Your muscles are effectively slaves to your nervous system. They're only going to do what they're told. Otherwise they lay inert. Your bones are slaves to those muscles and they're gonna move whichever way those muscles pull them. Same thing with those ligaments. So it's really important that we understand that our neurological system is what's gonna over control all of this. Whenever we go and we myelinate our nerves along with increase their diameter, we're gonna send the signal faster and we're going to do a better job of process or essentially sending this information. So questions. Now, another thing to understand is how we're always gonna have a certain amount of electrochemical or electromechanical delay before our muscles contract. So we're actually gonna send that electrical signal to the muscle, and then it's gonna take just a little bit to produce force because this is when the action potential is happening. And when we talk about it in exercise physiology, once it goes down the T-tubules and into the sarcoplastic reticulum, you can't see it anymore. But that's where we then have to release calcium from calcioquestrin. Calcium goes into the sarcoplasm, binds to troponin C, which in turn is going to move troponin T, so that tropomyosin is going to move off of the binding sites on actin, and then myosin is going to be able to grab hold, and then from there it's going to ratchet forward. This takes a little bit of time, and so that's what creates this natural mechanical delay. We are effectively, you know, bags of chemicals going through life doing, its, doing their best. And it's important to understand that every system we're using in our body is going, is reflexive whenever we're trying to move anything, we're trying to do anything. You can obviously do your best to predict the future, but obviously it's not something that we're really that good at. So now we're getting into something that might seem a little more existential, but it is an important concept to understand when it comes to humans. We are all living in the past, okay? Literally, you're, you're living in the past. So all the information that you're currently taking in, well, that's already happened. So you're when that light hits your retina, it is then processed into action potentials by the rods and cones of your eyes, which in turn is going to go through your optic nerves, through the thalamus, into the occipital lobe, and be processed into an image. When you hear something, 
Those are vibrations processed into individual um, central stimuli that is going to be effectively vibrations inside of the ear processed once again through the thalamus, through the auditory components of the brain, and then we hear a noise. All of these things require time. Then, so you process that visual information. That visual information is then going to be put through to other parts of your brain, which is going to tell you like, oh, there's a ball coming at me. I should dodge it. So that information is going to then go to your motor units and your motor units is going to cause your muscles to contract after they go down through your spinal nerves into those muscles. So hence why if someone's standing 50 yards away from you and they throw a, a baseball at you, you can easily dodge it. If someone's standing 20 yards from you and they throw a baseball at you and you're, you're looking at them when they do it, you're going to be able to dodge it. If they're standing five feet from you, you might not be able to get out of the way in time. And if they're literally up against you, you don't really have a chance. So because like anything else, we can only react so quickly. And I find that to be both a fascinating thing to really fully try to comprehend. But once again, it's an important thing to understand when we're working with anybody, which is it's not about where things are currently at, it's where they're going. Because once again, we're all living in the past. So, some concepts that we need to understand is good old strength. And that is literally gonna be the amount of torque we're gonna to be able to produce at a joint. Now we can do this by literally looking at maximal force that we're gonna go ahead and produce. We can do this by obviously compound movements where we're looking at maximal force throughout a full range of motion. So that's gonna be a concentric force. Isometric would be something like a hand grip dynamometer. And there's going to be a number of things that are going to affect this. So hence, you know, how much force we can produce the muscle is going to come down to really two things. One of which is how big is that muscle in the first place? And then two, how well trained is that muscle? Now, training obviously being the exercise you're doing, how good is the rate coding? So the amount of signal we can send to the muscle, how good is the intramuscular coordination? So our ability to send signals to that muscle. But another component to keep in mind is also how much fatigue because that is part of the training state of a muscle. So if you just worked out really hard yesterday and then we try to test your muscular strength, it's gonna be lower than it was before you started working out the day before because you have some fatigue in various forms inside of that muscle. Now, the moment arms themselves are going to obviously be influencing it. So obviously the further the distance that is from the joint, the harder it's going to be. And then obviously where that muscle attachment is and the angle it happens to be at. So that's why you typically see your best bench pressers are people who have pretty short arms and a big chest because they don't have to move the weight as far along with if you take a really wide grip, you barely have to move the weight at all because it turns out the bar doesn't actually have to travel that great of a distance. Whereas if you take a really narrow grip, then you're going to have to take the bar much further through that range of motion each time. So when you're looking at the mechanical advantage of different muscle groups, remember when we're at that resting length, that's where we're going to go ahead and have the greatest force production. So when we happen to be in that straight line, so this would be curling, but if we're lean back or lean forward, we're actually going to decrease it because now we don't have as much of optimal cross bridging. And notice the force vectors, when we're curling this way, it's only going up. When we're leaning back, it's going both up and backwards. When we're leaning forward, it's going both up and forwards. And so effectively, we're losing a little bit of that force production thanks to inefficiency with the vectors. So. Muscular power is, like we've talked about power before, it's work over time. So this is going to be effectively looking at that torque and velocity that's occurring at the same moment. The greater the power we're producing, the greater amount of work we're doing in a shorter period of time. So we've got that force velocity curve, but then we have the force power curve, which is arguably even more important for sport. And that we're gonna hit that peak power, usually it's about 30% of each of those maxes. And that's where we're going to obviously be able to move objects at the greatest, or we're going to be able to create the greatest amount of power. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be the most athletically successful. It just happens to be that overlap there. So hence why if you get stronger, 30% of your max becomes a greater number. And then at the same time, if you become faster, 30% of your peak velocity becomes a higher number, which in turn 
allows you to perform at a higher level. Science. Now, muscular endurance is literally our ability to produce force for a long period of time. Now there's both isometric muscular endurance. So how long can we hold a fixed position? This would be like holding a plank. And then there is dynamic muscular endurance. And this can be something like doing push-ups, pull-ups, uh, sit-ups. Now, muscles tend to operate better at a warmer temperature than your resting body temperature. That's why you literally warm up before exercise to get your body ready to go. This allows not just for more efficient muscular contraction, joint functioning, but also literally speed of our nerve transmissions to those muscles. Now, another thing to keep in mind is the natural force curves of different movements. Some movements are gonna be bell-shaped where we're gonna have the peak amount of force required somewhere in the middle. Others are gonna be descending, which is as we are going to be increasing our joint angle, the movement's gonna become easier. And others are gonna be ascending, which is as we are gonna be increasing that joint angle, things are gonna become more difficult. So a great example of ascending would be something like a back squat. Usually the bottom of the range of motion is the hardest part. Whereas a movement that's gonna be more descending, this can be something like effectively a pull-up, which is as we get ourselves higher and higher, it becomes harder and the bottom is usually the easiest. But understanding this interaction also gives you some properties of how you can train your muscles, which is when we're working on those muscle fibers and specifically we're talking about muscle coordination and stimulation for them, using movements that are going to have differing types of strength curves in turn are going to allow for you to do a much better job effectively building muscle. So a lot of barbell movements, the bottom is the hardest part, the top is the easiest. Whereas machine lifting or using things like bands and accommodating resistance, you can make the top of the movement become the hardest. And because of that, it's going to have slightly different overloading characteristics on your body's musculature. So we have gone through all of skeletal muscle for this course. Do you guys have any questions, comments, concerns before we start talking about stability and drag? <laughs> Good. All right. So, our final lecture. And then we just got your guys' presentations and then a lot of conversations about making sure that everybody's on the same page for what's going on, okay? So let's talk about stability. All we're really talking about is effectively how hard is it to knock something over? So if it's pretty hard to knock something over, that's gonna be what's known as a stable equilibrium. If it's really easy, that's gonna be what's known as an unstable equilibrium. And if something effectively can't be knocked over, it's got what's known as a neutral equilibrium, aka a ball. It's just gonna roll. Now, when we start moving, we're going to have effectively what's known as linear stability. So that's effectively of how good of a job do we do of efficiently moving ourselves in that straight direction. Whereas we can have a lack of linear stability and this is gonna be where you see the wavering movement side to side. I know obviously since things have been pretty quiet, we haven't uh, had a normal fall, but this would be the equivalent of somebody that's had one too many uh, tailgating at the football game or otherwise where you see them kind of doing the what, 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 and they can't really walk in a straight line. That's a lack of linear stability. Now we obviously then have rotational stability or rotary stability. And this is obviously how stable you are while you're rotating about an axis. So if you want a great example of that, look at people like throwers in track and field, uh, dancers, figure skaters, people that can spin at a high rate and keep their balance and hold their position and not fall over. Whereas once again, go back to drunks trying to move quickly or make a spin and then, well, they sometimes go into a face plant city, which is not a good place to go visit. So there's a number of things we can do to help with our own stability. First and foremost is just increase the size of the base sport. So if we're standing up, we're going to have our feet out wide. Then we're gonna make sure that our center line of gravity is within that base of support, which makes sense. So if you're gonna stand up, your center of gravity is somewhere inside of your feet. Because it was outside of your feet, you'd have to step forward to catch yourself, step backwards to catch yourself, move to the left, move to the right. Makes perfect sense. Now, if you have a lower center of gravity, and this can be from obviously squatting down, it's gonna make you more stable. And that's why you see a lot of sports being that athletic position. Plus it gives you a better advantage when you're trying to move. 
we can also then shift our line of gravity towards an oncoming force. So if you know somebody's coming in to try to push you from your left side, you're gonna put most of your body weight towards the left side of your body. And you're gonna extend that base, so step that foot out towards that force that's gonna be coming. And anyone that's played a sport where you've had a tackle or be tackled, you know it turns out the larger you are, the harder you are to knock over. So what we're going to do when it comes to measuring that center of gravity and the line of gravity is we're just looking at the distribution of mass because gravity is pulling everything straight down. So if from there we know those weights of the different segments of the body, we can effectively figure out where your center of gravity is going to be at. And this is something that you're going to see in the wonderful balance lab where that center of gravity, uh, the people that we had do it really don't do a great job of staying right in the center. They tend to lean a little bit to one side or the other. And that's completely normal because all of us are slightly asymmetrical. Now, when it comes to movement in fluids and gases, aka how we move, there's always going to be a certain amount of drag, okay? Because we don't live in a vacuum. And so we have to understand how these different fluids are going to move around the body, so liquids and gases. Now, we have what's known as hydrostatic pressure and buoyancy, okay? Hydrostatic pressure, we're talking about water pressure effectively. Now, we also have the same type of pressure in air, but it's easy to forget about that pressure because it's around us all the time. Now, we then have buoyancy. So that is going to be effectively how much of your mass is being lifted up by effectively that fluid you happen to be around. So it's a lot more obvious in things like water where you can float, or some of you can float. I cannot float. I float like a cannonball. It's frustrating. But you're going to have gravity pulling you down, but the buoyancy force pushing you upwards. And so that's really easy to see in water, okay? Now, when it comes to buoyancy in air, what is more buoyant than the ambient air we're all breathing right now? True. What gas is in the air? Like, what have you probably seen once or twice in your life? Yes. Yeah. Helium balloons. And then also we've got the same type of buoyancy effect from superheating air, which is going to be what you see in hot air balloons. Good. So as we're moving through these fluids, we're always going to have a certain amount of drag to our motion. Now, drag is obviously going to be much greater in water than it is in air. And this is going to be due to what's known as effectively our surface drag, so the surface of whatever object is going through it. And then form is going to be obviously how much or which way we're trying to move that surface through the water. So. For example, if you're trying to swim, if your legs are lower and you're not as streamlined as you go through the water, you in turn have a greater drag force, which means you need to for produce even more work and energy to go the same velocity. That's why, as you probably suspect, you're gonna move much faster the more streamlined you are. And that's why planes are not effectively planks that are flatly going through the air. Instead, they're thin and about as aerodynamic as they can be. Now, you in turn are also gonna develop what's known as wave drag. And this is gonna be where you're effectively producing 
waves as you ripple your way through. It's really easy to see when a boat goes through water because you see the waves it's naturally producing. With obviously air, if you've seen airplanes like taking off or landing and you can see sometimes how they whip up a lot of air around them, like you actually see kind of those vortices that they're producing, it's a swirling. And that's effectively due to as those wings and the body cuts through the air, it effectively disturbs the air around it. Now, this is really important because that drag is going to influence the trajectory of any projectile we put through the air. And because of this, it's going to cause baseballs, softballs, any really ball to effectively rotate and effectively cause it to spin, which, or that's, sorry, it's going to cause, that spin is going to cause the vortices to occur around the ball, which in turn is going to cause it to curve. So lift is going to be part of the force of that air going underneath or the fluid, which in turn is going to cause an object to go upwards. So thrust is what's pulling us forward or what we're pushing ourselves along with and drag is what's slowing us down. So part of the reasons why we can only run at certain speeds is actually due to the drag forces. When you hit your peak velocity, you literally cannot push yourself to go any faster thanks to actually the wind resistance. If you were in a vacuum, human beings could probably run much faster. Now, the overall effects of all of those vortices that you're producing thanks to the rotation about an object is what gives us our Magnus force. So this is where you can have what's known as a rise ball in softball where the ball is actually going to lift up a little bit thanks to that rotation of the pitch. You're going to have a curveball, which is going to cause it to go obviously down to the left or down to the right, depending on who's thrown by. So if it's a lefty, that rotation of the seams is going to cause the air to be pushed down harder on the left side and up higher on the right side, which in turn is going to effectively create a force that's going to make it go and curve effectively down and in if we're going from effectively left to right, whereas when a righty throws a curveball, it's going to break right to left. How are we doing with all this, guys? That's all we can hope for, guys. That's all we can hope for. The good news is after this, it's all review, and we can we can hit this. We can go through this stuff as much as you guys want. So. If we're looking for the formula for drag, which good news, it's never gonna show up on any of your finals, but the key is just understand here, of all the variables here, which is going to be the variable that has the greatest effect if we slightly increase it for increasing drag? Nope. Velocity, thank you, Haley, because notice it's velocity squared. So drag is all about effectively how fast you're going. So the faster you're going, the greater amount of drag you're going to be experiencing. Density, the coefficient is just kind of, it's just the basic coefficient doesn't change. Density is gonna be the density of the air. So it's like atmospheric pressure. Velocity is obviously how fast you're going. And then reference area is going to be the total area that's going through. So, if you're trying to effectively go faster, okay, you're going to have more drag. So you can try to decrease your reference area. And that's where you're going to see cyclists and otherwise get more in that bent over and extended position. So they're going to become more aerodynamically efficient so they can move a bit faster through the air. So you're going to see there's a number of components that are going to influence our ability to move through air and water. So the wonderful air temperature, higher temperatures are actually going to allow us to go at a faster speed, lower atmospheric pressure and actually higher humidities. Those are all going to influence in a positive way, meaning we're going to effectively have a lower amount of drag. And so when we're looking at the, essentially the vortices that are essentially being created, so that's gonna be the turbulence of the wake. Obviously, if we have something flat, it's gonna create the biggest amount followed by something that's gonna be spherical. And then finally, something that happens to have a natural teardrop uh, sorry, shape, which is what you naturally are gonna see on things like planes, 
both on the body and the wing itself so that we're creating a less turbulent wake so it's gonna move more efficiently through the air. So that concludes our broadcast day on all of the wonderful, exciting things that we're presenting on. I hope you guys are all doing okay since obviously things are just a little crazy these days. And hopefully to give you guys all a slight, a bit of entertainment, one of my friends sent me this um, the other night. I thought it was entertaining. Thank you, Luke. So obviously it's a joke. I don't think a chainsaw is gonna be necessarily that useful on the surface of Mars. Not to mention if it's gas powered, it technically won't work because there's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere that it would allow it to run. So do you guys have any other questions, comments, concerns? It's okay if, okay, cool. Awesome, okay, so Haley, I wanna to try to make this as pain-free for all of you guys, meaning the goal is that you guys are gonna simply submit your work uh, through the PowerPoint um, like submission online. And then I'm gonna put those, I'll, I'll put up a discussion board link so you guys can share it and like kind of everybody can see each other's. But I, if, I think it's kind of hard for you guys to have to present it via Zoom. And so that way you guys can record your slides to the best of your abilities. And then we can all kind of meet up and have a couple of days where we just kind of discuss it um, together over obviously Zoom. Um, are you guys all pretty comfortable with that of like literally recording your narration on your slides and otherwise? So each person records their own slides and then we submit it that way. So that way, obviously you can effectively, you know, you can take your best take. So no one's feeling like, you know, if you if you've had some struggles presenting that should make life things a lot easier for you guys. Um, so, but that would be something that's obviously take home where we're expecting everybody to go and watch your presentation before we meet and talk about it. <laughs> it is from the onion guys, which means it is a joke, but it does make me happy. I don't know. Something about uh, something about vengeance that always just lends itself to bring a little smile to my face. Okay, any other questions about your guys' uh, presentations and your projects? Because remember, you're only breaking down your joint. Don't worry about everybody else's. Just your joint when they're going, when the person, both the novice and the expert, are going through the movement. So we want to see the velocity. We want to see the acceleration. We want to see the torque, and then in turn infer the amount of force the muscle would have had to produce in order to make that happen. And remember, it's going to be not just the immediate limb that's attached to it, but then everything that effectively is being supported either up or down the chain. Meaning, if we were to look at the pull-up and you had the elbow, well, yes, you're lifting the weight of the upper arm, but you're also lifting the weight of the rest of the entire body along with it. Okay, if this is great. If someone doesn't do their part of the presentation, I'm recording this, please follow this exactly to the letter. Leave a slide in there that simply said, this is person blank's presentation slide, because then they're going to get a zero. And it's the equivalent of effectively standing next to someone who's far less attractive than you, because it makes you look that much better. So you want them to do that because they get a zero. You are graded only on your slide. So hence why you say, this is the joint that I'm doing in your paper. And then in your presentation, like just because of our, like Catherine or sorry, be like shoulder and then next to it, Catherine Horn. And then, you know, next one, elbow, slappy never showed up. And then like, sweet. And there's literally like, it just says elbow, that's it. Like, congratulations, you received a zero and you let the whole team down because I'm a big fan of group uh, work where if you don't do the group work, you suffer and you don't get to ride on the coattails of all of you guys that are working hard. Yeah, leave, leave that slide in there for, for me because it reminds me to give them a zero. 
And it's going to, it's just, you know, nothing like some good old public shame. So that way, you know, everybody else in class can be like, oh, damn. Slappy Mix didn't do his stuff, really let the whole team down. Any other questions with your projects, uh, presentations, or just you know studying, obviously, all the information that we've covered so far in this class? Sounds good. Plan on bringing some questions for next time, guys. Take a look at that study guide. You know, I'm trying to be straightforward with what my expectations are for you guys and the things I want you guys to know. But stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves. Lord knows things are a little crazy these days. And um, yeah. <laughs>